from Triple E Media. I'm Ramat Mohammed, and this is The Backstory. On Friday, that's tomorrow, October 1st, Nigeria will be celebrating our 61st anniversary, that's 61 years, of independence from British colonial rule. Now, most people were taught that Nigeria made a move for independence in 1953, and then independence was granted in 1960. But that's actually not the way it played out, and Alex is here to explain. For this episode, Richard, John, and Cune Austin will reenact parts of the arguments that were made in favor of and against Nigeria's independence. And one more thing before we start, this episode is our last episode in September. We're going to take a break for two weeks and we'll be back with a new episode on the 19th of October. Okay, enjoy today's episode. It was Tuesday, March 31st, 1953. Members of the House of Representatives were all seated in this huge chamber in Lagos. Remember back then, Lagos was Nigeria's political and economic capital city. The chamber had two levels, the upper level and the lower level, and all the seats were arranged in a U-shape. The president of the House of Reps was seated on this um, elevated platform in front of the room. And just above his seat, over his head, was this big round emblem, the seal of the British crown. For our listeners who are not familiar with Nigeria's history, here's a brief explanation. Nigeria came into existence in 1914, and before that, the region consisted of units that managed themselves along tribes. The Hausa tribe dominated the northern region above the Niger and Benue rivers, The Yoruba tribe dominated the region west of the River Niger, and the Igbo tribes were most dominant in the region east of the River Niger. The British, they came along in the 1800s and started trading with these regions. Along the way, they found that it was convenient for them, the British, to bring these three regions together under one entity in order to simplify administration. So in 1914, they created Nigeria and oversaw the economic and political activities of the region. So on that day, in the chamber in 1953, the British still ruled over Nigeria. It was a full house that day. Almost every seat was taken and the rep members were all going through, you know, the day's proceedings. They had already reviewed about five motions and they were getting to the last one of the day. And then this man, Anthony Inahoro, stood up. Now, Anthony Inahoro was a member of the action group a political party that represented the Western region. He was a fairly young man. He was just 29 years old at the time. The house was still a bit rowdy, a little noisy. You know, people are whispering, talking amongst themselves as Mr. Anahara stood up. He was dressed in this crisp white shirt and fitted black suit. He's fiddling with his jacket buttons with his right hand. And then he's gripping this document in his left. He lightly touches his big framed glasses and he clears his throat. <clears> Sir, <throat> so, this motion is an invitation to the honorable members of this house to associate the highest legislature of our land with the expressed desire of the peoples of this country whose views we all represent for political autonomy in 1956. The house went completely silent. I mean, you could hear a pin drop. Anthony Inahoro had just given notice that Nigeria wanted to be free of British rule by 1956. For many years, they have ruled us. We are not unreasonable people. And like a good house servant, it is only fair that we should give our masters notice of our intention to quit so that they can affect arrangements, either to employ new servants or to serve themselves. We do not wish to take them by surprise. On the contrary, we wish to invite them to cooperate with us in the attainment of our objectives. This motion is designed, therefore, to acquaint the British public with what we are thinking, with what we are feeling, so that our agitation in 1956 for self-government 
will not come to them as a surprise. This motion will afford the British government sufficient time within which to arrange gradual withdrawal and progressive transfer of power to Nigerians. The year 1956, it wasn't only chosen to give the British time to get their affairs in order, it was also convenient. 1956 is convenient, sir, because it is the year which will see the end of the present constitution. To recommend a date earlier than 1956 would be to put a premature end to the life of this constitution. And although I myself can contemplate such a course with pleasure, we know too well how strenuously some sections of the country would resist it. To settle on a later date would mean a further period in national slavery, a prospect which I do not think any honorable member would welcome. So Anthony Unahara finished the motion, it got seconded, and then Amadou Bello stood up. Alaji Amadou Bello was 43 years old at the time, 14 years older than Anthony Unahara. He was a descendant of Usman Dan Fodio, and he carried himself like it. He was already the Sarodana of Sokoto, which means he was the crown prince of Sokoto, and he was also the chief advisor to the Sultan of Sokoto. He would later go on to become knighted by Queen Elizabeth herself in 1959 and take on the title Sir Alaji Amadubalo. But I digress. At this point in 1953, he was still just Alaji Amadubalo. So he stands up and he's this larger than life figure, really tall with broad shoulders, even at 43. He's dressed in the traditional Babanriga with a matching turban. We from the Northern region never intended, nor do we intend to retard the progress of any region, nor do we say that those who demand self-government, if it is for their own region alone, are wrong. Far from it, for after all, every community is the best judge of its own situation. We of the North wish our form of self-government, once granted, to be such that its attainment should give us no cause for eventual regret. It is true that we politicians always delight in talking loosely about the unity of Nigeria. Sixty years ago, there was no country called Nigeria. The great day came with the introduction of Richard's constitution in 1947. For the first time in our history, indigenous citizens of the North sat side by side with the South to legislate for one Nigeria and share in the discussion of Nigerian affairs. That was in 1947. Meanwhile, sir, our comrades in the South had been taking part in the discussion of their own affairs in the legislature as far back as 1922. What Amadou Bello said was that the southern part of the country, which had been ruled directly by the British, already had an advantage. They were already part of the British political system, which meant that the political parties were, you know, more developed. But the northern part of the country, which was ruled indirectly, wasn't part of the British political system until 1947, so there wasn't enough time for the North to, to, to learn and adopt the British system. Sir, the 1947 constitution was to last nine years, very probably in order to give the North sufficient time to learn. That constitution, sir, was revised. After the North had gained only two years experience, and now we have a new constitution, which has been barely a year in existence. Essentially, he's saying that the rules kept changing and shifting before the North could, could catch up. And they were not happy about that. Eventually, the debate was adjourned, the bill was not voted on, and everybody went their separate ways. It wasn't until four years later in 1957 that there was another move for independence this time by Chief Samuel Ladoke Akintola from the Western region, also from the Action Group. This time, the speech calling for independence was very different from the first speech. Colonialism and imperialism are synonymous. 
and I need not recount that imperialism is evil. It has a lot of elements of evil in it, and in saying that, I will not rely on my own word. I would cite an instance in which one of the imperialists admitted that imperialism contains a lot of elements of evil. It's definitely a change in tone here. He basically spends the first half of his speech talking about evil imperialism. Now remember, back in 1957, the Soviet Union had been spreading propaganda about how evil imperialism was, something that was practiced by some of the European countries at the time. In his speech, he even compared the imperialists to predators. Imperialism is a hunger and it creates a lot of predatory instincts in man, whereby man becomes a wolf to another. The objective in this case is therefore to put an end to this evil of imperialism or colonialism. Now, it's not only greed that is the evil effect of imperialism. Practically, all wars that have been fought in human history arose either directly or indirectly as a result of imperialistic tendencies in some people. If, therefore, the abortion of imperialism is brought nearer, it may bring us nearer to peace, perfect and absolute peace among human beings. We searched and we searched and we couldn't find records of exactly how the British Parliament reacted to this speech. But based on the world events at the time, I mean, we could kind of guess the British must have been worried about the spread of the Soviet influence. Remember that around that time, the Cold War was, it was already brewing between the Soviets and the West. And then in 1957, the same year that Chief Akintola made the second move for independence, groups of Africans visited the Soviet Union. And in return, Soviet political workers disguised as scholars came to Africa. They gave speeches, talks, lectures, broadcasts. So there was definitely interaction between Africans and the Soviets. And this, this must have made the British feel uneasy. But even with that, the British didn't immediately agree to set a date for Nigeria's independence. We're not sure why, but we do know that the two parties, that's the Nigerian delegates and the British delegates, continued discussions that year. In fact, we know that they had 21 sessions on constitutional reviews alone between May and June of 1957. After these talks, a third motion for independence was raised the following year in July 1958 by Remy Lekun Fanny Kayode, the father of none other than Femi Fanny Kayode. And it was after that motion that the British agreed. They agreed to set October 1st, 1960 as the day Nigeria would become independent. And as that day came closer, the British Parliament discussed parts of the independence bill. What you're about to hear now is a reenactment of actual comments which were made by different members of the British Parliament back in July 1960, a few months before Nigeria got independence. We've selected comments that represent the general discussion, and for simplicity, we're going to be using one voice actor, but the comments were made by several different parties. <coughs> My lords, today we are taking part in the birth of a nation. The birth of a nation was, in fact, the name of a very early film, which noble lords may have seen. But today, this is no cinema projection, no figment of the imagination, and no celluloid story that we are seeing. It is an exciting piece of real history. The bringing into being of a great federation of ancient African states. Old in history and tradition, but new as a state. Self-governing, independent, and as well as we are all delighted to hear. Members of the British Commonwealth, as the noble Lord, Lord Twenty, he said, an exciting time. We come, all of us, to convey to the state our best wishes. When one meets Nigerians, one cannot but be impressed by their poise and dignified bearing. 
which are manifestations of their self-respect and self-confidence. They have produced not only leaders, but statesmen who have approached the goal of independence with a marked sense of responsibility. Unlike the leaders in some other countries, they have been in no undue hurry to obtain independence on the crest of a wave of emotion. They have shown restraint and studied the problem before them, have been willing to take advice and have weighed matters carefully before reaching a decision. When the three regions are together, they have a diversity of production, cocoa, granules, palm oil, cornels, cotton, timber, hides, and now even oil. That economic unity will provide the basis for a sound economy. And I think that that diversity will give them strength when they go into the money markets of the world. It will give them strength too when they talk to the World Bank to ask for additional funds. My one regret about this bill is that the women of the Northern region are not enfranchised. In the East, yes. In the West, yes. In the North, not yet. Because they are a Muslim country. Other Muslim countries have developed now to the point of equal enfranchisement of women and men. And my great appeal will be to the people of Northern Nigeria to recognize human equality as well. The equality expressed in their independence. I have agreed with every speech that has been made in this debate. With the exception of the last one, how does a country build a dam in an underdeveloped area without economic planning? How are roads or schools built without economic planning? Although nationhood and independent statehood have been reached in Nigeria, there are still very difficult tasks ahead for the Nigerian people. First, there is the great problem of how to weld into unity for great national purposes. Three great divisions of people with different traditions and different languages and religions. Secondly, there is the problem of how to get the constitution to work if it's to have some regard to the variety of people, their tribal differences and different traditions and structures trying to discover how to get a strong central government and how to distribute the functions and powers to regions in order that they may feel they have reasonable autonomy has been one of the greatest tasks done. But it will be one of the greatest difficulties which will have to be worked out further in the days ahead. Above all, there is the great difficulty of working democracy itself. It is all very well for us to think that because of our own traditions and experience with this method of government, it is comparatively easy to work. But when we are dealing with a country such as Nigeria with its tropical and non-industrial background, where large numbers of people are illiterate and immature in political experience. There is a tremendous task in trying to shape political institutions which can give democratic results. The learning of tolerance and resistance to corruption, vital elements in the working of democracy, are also factors which have to be reckoned with when new states are born. There is one last thought which I would like to leave with the Secretary of State. States are emerging to independence and other territories will be clamoring for independence. Are we quite sure that our work of preparation for independence is as thorough, sound, and adequate as it might be? Ought we not to put a little more emphasis even while the territories remain dependent on the extension of education, on steps to make the economic foundation of the territories a little more secure, on building up local government and 
create greater facilities for training the people who would take over the administration? I suggest that in the territories which are moving to independence, at least in our policies and methods of administration, greater attention should be paid to the defects which have been brought out by our experience in recent years. We have found that some states have become independent, inadequately equipped for the task which political necessity is imposing on them. The Backstory is brought to you by Triple E Media Productions, Production Copyright 2021 Triple E Media Productions. If you enjoyed this episode of The Backstory and want to hear more, subscribe to our 234 Audio YouTube channel. Episodes of this podcast and our other podcasts can also be found on our website, 234audio.com, as well as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. This episode of The Backstory was produced by Alexandra Gekpe, Richard Anyabe, Dominic Tabakaji, and Sam Tabakaji. Executive Producer Ramat Muhammad. Special thanks to Rabia Hadeja and Mala Iwa Bagdu Ikaleku. Special thanks to Usman Ibrahim and Kune Austin for their assistance in producing this episode. If you are interested in sponsoring this program, reach out to us at 0818-230-1234 or email us at info at 234audio.com.